I just counted up. There are actually over 75 motors in these machines in the arcade. Uh, the very smallest ones, tiny motors at the back of the wheel for the cyclists. Then the biggest motors are actually under the bed of QuickFit. This is the aerobic workout that uh, does all the work for you. Um, and they're four motors, great big ones like this. <laughs> And um, it actually was an old toning table, this thing. Uh, so it came with all the motors attached. And there are even motors inside things like the change machine, which you probably don't think about, but you know, you've got to have something to suck the note in. Whoops, oh, didn't like that. And then another motor, to um, push the coins out. Well, most of the motors in here are DC motors, simple DC motors. Uh, and that's what I have most experience of and that most of this video is going to be about them. Though, uh, near the end, I'm going to look more briefly at stepper motors and other sorts of motors. Uh, it's quite long, so uh, here's the chapter list so you can jump uh, wherever you want. There are actually nearly as many electric motors in my workshop as there are in the arcade. Um, I depend on them so much. I'd rather have my motors than I would my computers. Um, anyway, I'll start with a bit of history. Uh, the first people to make electricity move uh, anything were gentlemen scientists from the 18th century playing with static electricity. Um, this is my static electric generator, uh, a Van de Graaff generator. Um, I hope this doesn't make the cameras go funny. made the close-up camera go funny anyway. Um, I might get another close-up for that. Um, so what, they, what these gentlemen scientists did is they found that if they put a spike on top of their electrostatic generator, theirs were hand-cranked. Mine, ironically, is powered by an electric motor. Um, and they put this disc on with, with these little points and then they charged up the thing that these little things come around. Well the conventional explanation of this is that uh, the charge or electrons are streaming off the points of this thing. And if you look at it in the dark, you'd actually see a green corona glow. But it's not really any help at all in understanding how today's motors work. Michael Faraday, who I just by coincidence happened to have in my garden, uh, may have invented the first DC motor in 1822. I never actually made one till now. Um, so you start off with a permanent magnet, uh, north at one end, south at the other. And then uh, he had a, a glass dish. Um, I've made this bit of plastic just to keep the magnet in the centre of the, the dish. Uh, then there's this wire. Um, now the wire, I want to put that into the dish. It's a brass wire. Uh, now we connect uh, one wire to the brass and the other wire to the edge of the disc. So there's no path for electricity at the moment. Um, but now you add the magic ingredient, which is the mercury. But it must be fun. Uh, 
and unusually this actually just worked first time I tried it. But these motors had, <laughs> I don't know if they really should be called motors, they have absolutely no power at all. Um, I suppose they do show that electricity uh, interacts with magnetism. I think a better starting point is just to think of the basic properties of what happens to electricity flowing through a wire. So um, these effects are usually too small to be noticeable, um, but I'm going to use a 15 amp power supply at about uh, 24 volts. So I'm going to wrap um, a length of wire around a nail. In fact, I'll use a, a my drill to speed this up a bit. that should do. Um, now I've got to strip the ends of the wire. Let's connect it up. One there. Um, the first thing I'm going to try and show that the wire becomes magnetic. So this is just a simple DC power supply. And if I turn it off, I make it a bit more Increases the magnetism. Uh, but this also now is showing the other effect of electricity um, in a wire. It also becomes hot. <laughs> Which can be a, quite a menace in electric motors actually. Um, it's, the electromag it's the magnetic effects that are useful. Well, the first person to make a recognisable electric motor was a Benedictine Hungarian monk called Anjos Jedlik in 1827. And I was delighted to find the image of his motor because it's surprisingly like a funny one I made a long time ago to demonstrate how motors work. So uh, if I just hook this up to another... Uh, uh, a slightly lower powered DC supply um, so it doesn't get too hot. You can see it's quite enthusiastic and the sparks are the, um, the electricity jumping the gap between the static little bits of copper and the rotating ring. So the electricity flows in through this coil, static coil, down, up through the strip of copper and into this ring. This ring's a bit of uh, old plumbing tube that I cut in half. It uh, goes up this wire, goes through the two coils and back down into the other half because it's split down the middle. So, so for instance, if this one is being attracted to that one, it swings around till it almost it gets here, gets there. But then at that point, uh, the the it reaches the end of this bit of the ring and contacts the other one instead and that reverses the polarity of the magnetism going in this in the rotor and so suddenly it's being repelled from that one and attracted to this one so it comes around to there and then suddenly the commutator that's what the ring is called uh, swaps again and suddenly it's being repelled again and the cycle just keeps repeating and that's basically what makes it go round well the very first motors, the very first motors did have four electromagnets like this, um, but it was soon found, particularly as permanent magnets improved, uh, that you could use permanent magnets instead of the two outer static ones. I hope I got that right way round. So I've just put a, a couple of rare earth magnets on the outside, and I'm not going to use the, these wires. Uh, now I'm going to go straight into the copper strips so it's just the two um, magnets in the middle that will be um, active. And you can see it works almost as well 
Um, and it, if I had them uh, rare earth banks a bit closer, it would work uh, even faster. And this is now a more common form of motor with uh, permanent magnets on the stator uh, and the coils on the rotor. But this design is actually still very inefficient because for most of the time the poles are miles apart so there's not much force when it's there to there. It's only when it gets close that it's suddenly attracted hard and then repelled again. So sometimes called a St. Louis motor this. Um, but motors didn't really become the, the universal efficient things they are today. They're actually sort of 70 to 90 percent efficient at converting electrical energy into mechanical energy. They're very efficient. Um, the transformation was in the shape of the permanent magnets, well the shape of the whole thing really. So in a modern motor the permanent magnets are these ferrites that uh, are, are shaped to fit very closely to the armature, to the rotor. Um, so there's only a very small gap between the two and as it rotates they're, they're all constantly in close contact. And of course unlike my motor that just had the two segments on the commutator ring, uh, this has many different ones and also many different windings in the coil. It's also finely balanced, these little uh, blobs are to um, even out uh, the weight uh, so it doesn't vibrate as it rotates. So the basic design of these motors hasn't really changed much for a hundred years. One of the extraordinary things about DC motors is their extraordinarily large size range. This is my tiniest motor uh, it's the thing that makes a, a phone vibrate uh, and I've given it four legs so it's a little insect. But there are motors that are much smaller than that. Then at the other end of the spectrum there are much much larger motors than my largest. Uh, Really the main difference I think between the big ones and the tiny ones is that the tiny ones tend to have fewer coils and fewer segments on the commutator. This one just has uh, three segments and three coils. But if I now look at my biggest motor, um, I can't expose the commutator easily on this. Um, but I'm hoping that you could be able to see uh, if I rotate it by hand you can see there are lots and lots of segments and there are lots and lots of coils around the uh, armature as well. I actually counted 40 segments on uh, this commutator. And really big motors have many more segments. But apart from that the tiny ones and the big ones are pretty much identical. So uh, another useful thing about uh, these simple DC motors is that they're very easy to reverse. So all you have to do is to just swap the terminals over. So that one goes there and this one goes here. Now this can be a bit confusing because the motors do tend to come with um, markings of, of which polarity is uh, the favoured one. So like this motor has a, a red spot there. Um, this one has a, a little positive symbol there. Um, and actually the wiper motor itself, one of the wires is green for negative and the other one is brown for positive. So there's a preferred direction because of the precise position of the where the brushes uh, meet the uh, commutator ring. Um, and so I think when you reverse them uh, you reduce the power a bit and maybe also its life. Uh, but I've never had any problems with this and to all extents and purposes the difference is pretty small.
So then uh, the motors all have a rated voltage and speed. They can actually work at quite a big speed range. This is a 24 volt wiper motor uh, that I'm currently running at about 8 volts, I think. That's about 24 volts now. And I regularly run them at uh, lower voltages uh, just to get the particular speed that I want. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about more about speed control in a bit. Just to finish uh, the basic properties of motors, um, another extraordinary thing about them is that they can work equally well become generators. Here I've uh, connected an LED uh, to a little motor, a little DC motor. If I now uh, spin it round with a um, battery drill, I hope that... Just And in fact, if you just connect two of these motors directly together um, and spin one with the drill, the other one will rotate. And this actually is how all our household electricity is generated, or at least most of it. Um, the fossil fuels um, generate heat, which are used to power, uh, create steam, to power steam turbines, and the turbines uh, drive the generators that aren't that different from ordinary DC motors. The principle is basically the same, but obviously the details are different. So the intimate uh, connection between magnetism and electricity has some quite curious effects for motors, um, very useful ones. Uh, so this motor, um, its resistance of the coils is, it's, it varies a bit, but between 1.7 and 2 ohms around there. Uh, it's a 24 volt motor, so if it was just obeying ohms law, it would be drawing over uh, 12 amps at full speed. Um, but if I now um, run it up to speed, it's actually only drawing 0.9 of an amp. So the reason for this is that this motor, DC motors are actually simultaneously acting as generators. And the electricity they're generating is called the motor's back EMF, or ele back electromagnetic force. And uh, so the actual, the net voltage drop across uh, the motor is, is pretty tiny. But if we now load up the motor, and for this I'm going to try um, and use the motor to lift this heavy weight. So if I connect this again, uh, it should start off with the uh, low load until it takes up the slack and then the current, you'll see what happens. Okay, the current has gone right up to 3 amps. Oops. You can also um, hear the motor slow down when it takes up the slack. So what's happening is that uh, as it slows down, it's reducing the back EMF, the energy it's generating, and allowing more current to flow through the motor. Uh, so it's only taking the current it, it needs. Well, don't worry if you don't fully understand it, but uh, uh, the great advantage is it means these simple DC motors have a particularly high starting torque because when they start off from rest, there's no back EMF and all the current goes through the, all the voltage goes through the motor. Um, and when they get up to speed, uh, they're only during the current they need. When a load comes on, the voltage goes down and the current increases. And these ideal characteristics are why so many railway engines, diesel engines, are actually diesel electric. So they have a diesel engine that is connected to a generator and then the generator powers DC motors that are on the connected to the wheels. 
though the high starting torque's so brilliant, um, the high currents involved uh, are quite scary. So uh, if with one of my ordinary motors, uh, I'm not usually running them at full power, so uh, less than two amps, but I still need a five amp power supply for the starting current. Uh, and if I am running them at full speed, uh, I then need a 10 amp power supply. Just simple things like if you've got 10 amps, you need thick wires to cope with the current. Uh, the, these supplies are quite good because if there is a short, they cut out. But there are occasions, particularly with even bigger motors, where I still uh, use a toroid transformer and a bridge rectifier. Um, so for these, I've taken to adding uh, thermal fuses actually strapped to the windings so they can just detect if uh, they're getting warm if they're overheating. Uh, the other, last thing I do with more powerful motors is to put a fuse in line, usually close to the motor, so as, act as a sort of visual reminder. And for this, uh, there are special things called time delay or slow blow or anti-surge fuses. These will let uh, a high current pass for a short period of time. That should be enough for the starting current uh, to subside and for the motor to have reached uh, full speed before the fuse blows. But it is easy to get confused, so uh, I thought I should include this cautionary tale. Uh, I had a nightmare with this when pirate practice was new. So when you first get on the machine, um, there's a linear actuator in the bottom here and uh, it lifts you up into the right position. So you can now bounce up and down uh, to make the boats go up. Well, um, once or twice a week, the fuse for this that actuators, there's one on each side, uh, would just mysteriously blow for no reason I could tell. Um, and I was convinced it was that uh, the high starting torque and I needed a bigger fuse. So I kept gradually increasing the fuse rating. Um, well, that was a big mistake. Eventually, it got uh, so hot that smoke started coming out of the machine and some of the wires had started to melt. It was terrifying. Um, well, I took it home and sorted it all out, added extra fuses and stuff. Uh, but it wasn't for another few months before I got, really got to the bottom of the problem. Uh, this is uh, my spare. This is an identical linear actuator. And the problem were the two limit switches. In fact, they're Hall effect sensors. Uh, so when the ram gets to the end of its travel, uh, these should send a signal to the logic controller to switch off the motor. But just occasionally, they just weren't working. They just weren't sending the signal. Uh, so uh, then the ob the answer was obvious. I just replaced them with simple little reed switches down here. And I've had no trouble with it since. Fortunately, nothing actually caught fire, but I've been paranoid about all this sort of stuff ever since. So um, just things like fusing and, uh, and, and the fire rating of the materials. You know, people don't often get electrocuted these days, but electrical fires are still sadly quite common. Uh, back EMF is also useful for braking a motor, for making it stop quickly. Uh, normally, when you've uh, got a motor running and you disconnect it, it runs on for a little, a fraction of a second. There's quite a lot of momentum in the armature that takes a little while to stop. But back EMF can help. So if I connect this green wire now, what I'm going to do, instead of just switching it off this time, I'm going to switch it from the red wire to the green wire. So then there's just going to be a circuit that goes from the motor back to itself. 
initially when it's still running um, when you've just switched it off there's still a lot of back EMF in the motor uh, but that acts to um, slow it down really rapidly so this time I'll get it running the difference is a little bit subtle I normally use this circuit uh, with a logic controller and a relay. A relay has changeover contacts. Uh, I've programmed this so that uh, one input will make the motor start running, set the motor running, uh, and then when I connect this switch um, it'll stop when it passes the switch. So let's get ready to do that. Yes, and you can see, just connected normally, uh, it ran on for about 45 degrees. So if I now connect the extra contact, like, like I did before, uh, um, and do it again. And it stops dead. <laughs> it's still on the uh, switch. It's very satisfying. Well I first discovered this uh, over 20 years ago um, and I was nervous about it to start with because I thought that the current might burn out the contacts of the relay. Uh, but uh, obviously not. I've used it on loads of machines now uh, and never had any problems with the relay contacts. So um, it's a good thing, this circuit. Uh, the most common way that I control the speed is to use uh, um, an ordinary power supply, a 24 volt or a 12 volt, and then reduce the speed with diodes, a bank of diodes. Uh, diodes block the current completely in one direction, but in the forward direction, each diode is supposed to drop the voltage by 0.7 volts. In practice I find uh, it's not uh, quite as accurate as that, um, but it is still very useful. So I've just connected the diodes in series. If I short out the diodes, you can hear the speed increase. And in fact, if I run the wire along the different diodes, shorting out different numbers, you can hear the speed gradually reducing. So that's how I get the precise speed that I want. But uh, these days, uh, you can just buy from China these little uh, speed control units. Uh, in the past, uh, I found them rather unpredictable and they often blew up and stuff, but uh, the, these recent ones seem to be very good. Uh, and this, these even come with a reversing switch, so you can go one way or the other. And you get a nice big speed range with the potentiometer. And the way these work is that they chop up the current. So um, it's switching it on and off and off, or off and on and off and on. Uh, and it's the ratio of the on time to the off time that is the output speed. When it's going slowly, uh, there's more off than there is on and vice versa. So when it's going fast, uh, it's mostly on with short off periods. Of course the other way to reduce the speed of a motor is with gears, a gearbox. Uh, and in fact I very rarely use an ungeared motor. Uh, so my ordinary windscreen wiper motors for instance um, have a, a, a little gearbox under this cover or at least a worm gear. Um, and I think you can just see the teeth on the white uh, plastic as well. Well, worm gears, uh, I really like them because uh, for, for a start, they reduce the depth of a motor so that if you haven't got much depth going back in that way, um, the motor just sort of sticks out to the side, if you like. Uh, and I find that is very convenient for many situations. The other thing I really like about worm gears 
is that um, they're very easy to use. So th on this wiper motor, I've added an extra worm gear. Um, you can just buy the, the actual gears, they're quite cheap. Um, but they're easy to fit. The tolerances aren't as tight as for uh, other gears. Um, and again, this sort of changing the direction of motion by 90 degrees, uh, it, I also find very useful. Uh, and another final thing that's useful about them is that they provide a sort of lock. The motor won't turn because however hard you push on this bronze gear, it's not going to make that one go round. But then there's another sort of gearbox that's very common, um, which is uh, just spur gears. So out the motor on this one, there's this uh, little spirally spur gear um, and it goes into this gearbox on this side. Uh, goes in there and then there are multiple stages in here um, reducing it to the big output shaft that has a, a big bearing in. Uh, the reason for the spiral is that I think that it uh, helps to reduce the noise. Uh, these spur gear uh, can be quite noisy. Then uh, the sort of Rolls-Royce of uh, gearboxes uh, these little ones called epicyclic gears. If I can, yes, I can just, uh, oh dear, I've dropped out the other. I'm just going to drop one of the li other little gears from in here. Um, oops. <laughs> They're very fiddly, these little things. Whether I'll get it back or not, I don't know. Oh no, another one's come off. <laughs> well, that's going to be a right old fiddle to get it back. Um, I think perhaps I'll stop at that point. Well, I did eventually get it back together again. <laughs> what a palaver. And it's now uh, working fine. It's 104 to 1. Remarkably compact for such a big reduction. The load is always shared between the three planetary gears. So they have a lot of power. Um, and they're usually pretty quiet. I mean, this I think I may have made this one a bit more noisy. Uh, it's... Um, Epicyclic are usually quieter than spur gears, but you really always have to test them by putting them on a resonant surface. So, so just putting them on the bench changes the noise uh, quite a lot. When you're buying a motor, it's uh, sometimes useful to look at the spec and the specifications. Uh, but this is the spec for the Bosch motors I use all the time. Um, so it tells you the voltage, the number of watts, the nominal current, and the speed, 42 RPM. Um, but the one I find particularly useful is the breakaway torque, uh, which I call the starting torque. It's the same thing. Torque is a measure of distance times force. Uh, Newton meters is what it's usually measured in. So um, if you imagine the uh, motor here, uh, trying to lift a weight on the end of this arm. Here I've got a, um, what is it? It's about 2.7 kilograms weight. The weight, uh, this mass times gravity is the force that it exerts in Newton. So uh, gravity is 10 meters per second squared. So this is exerting a force of 27 Newton in my hand. I mean, you can, you can see fairly intuitively that there's more force to get the motor to start when the weight's right over here than, uh, than if it's right close to the uh, motor. So, uh, say I have it at uh, 500 millimetres from the pivot. Um, the torque is 13 and a half Newton meters. So uh, this motor actually will take, claims to take 27 um, Newton meters. So that would be, I could have it a whole right out there somewhere. Um, I'm not sure if that would work. So now I've fitted the motor on and we can try it out at uh, 13 and a half Newton meters. So, uh, I'll just check that. Yep, that works. Um, this isn't quite long enough to test the full 27, but this 
is less so it should still work. Yeah, that works. Well now, I think this weight is three and a half kilograms. So, um, what, have, what have we got here? Well, it's roughly sort of 750. God, my makes my brain hurt, that sum. We'll do it by trial and error and see what happens. Can't cope. Okay, so it can't do that. Move it in a bit. Almost. Not quite. Oh, the rated spec isn't too far off. I don't usually, I don't go by these things religiously, but I find it's useful to keep in my mind when I just have a rough feel of what the motor will do. Of course, individual motors have their own quirks and strengths and weaknesses. Um, these uh, wiper motors that uh, I bought for a long time direct from Bosch, um, it's good they have a big variety so I can choose the speed, the voltage um, and other details or well, particularly having a shaft on, on the end. Um, you might think that was normal but if you just go to a scrapyard and buy a, a wiper motor they've very often just got a little cone and a thread um, which is much more difficult to work with. Um, you can make a shaft for them, you can drill out the, uh, a bit of bar and use a cone cutter because it's about the right angle to make the cone. The other slight problem with wiper motors is that the, the bearings aren't brilliant. They're just a couple of bronze bushes in, in here. Uh, and if you're running the motor under a quite a big side load, like uh, if you've got a pulley under tension with a, a belt, then uh, the bearings can seize up. If you're not too fussy about the detail spec, uh, you can buy them now on eBay with, with shafts uh, direct from China. They're so useful just as basic industrial uh, things. Well, for tiny motors, if you've got the money, um, the nicest ones are made by German ones, made by Maxon and Fallhalber. Gorgeous little things. Again, an epicyclic gearbox in there. Amazing amount of power in such a, a small thing. More normally, uh, I, I would buy cheaper ones. Um, these are made in China. And, you know, they're not bad. They, 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 uh, I'm not running my machines continuously, they're not in use continuously, so I haven't had much trouble with them. Uh, the only trouble with the Chinese things is that they're a little bit hit and miss. So these motors, uh, there are lots of them on eBay uh, at the moment, um, they, they, they're good because they come in lots of speeds and I like the fact they've got the right angle gearbox on. Um, but I have one bunch that just wouldn't go backwards if you reverse the terminals. And I took the, the end off and found that the um, strips of springy metal are acting on the commutator um, were actually digging in when the, you tried to make the, the motor go backwards. Uh, I've had other ones since and they haven't had that problem at all. Um, but I think maybe quality control. Oh, also because I had this one, which I think you can see the, uh, the, the worm gear coming out of the motor has got so worn um, that uh, the whole thing just uh, completely, completely failed. What happened there, I don't know. So anyway, Chinese motors are a bit hit and miss. Uh, when I was making Trust Wildlife, uh, I needed um, some, so I did some research. I bought a number of different sorts and uh, put them all on test uh, and left them for a month or two. And it's quite surprising. Um, that one didn't do so well. That one wasn't bad. This was the real marathon. It's got a tiny little, <laughs> like a foam vibrator motor inside, because this is just the gearbox on the outside. Um, but for some reason, these just lasted and lasted.
The problem is that all these seams, they're so close together that there's very little space for the motors. So I had to make, the, I wanted them to be as, as thin as possible. So uh, these are the little Chinese ones I chose. Um, and they had steel gears, so they looked a bit better. Um, one has failed uh, already. The others, there are about six of them in there. The others look okay. Um, but as always with these Chinese ones, it's a little bit of a lottery. Uh, so I'm hoping for the best. Now, who must enjoy playing with balls? We think making balls fly is probably another coping strategy for their own lack of flight. And note their distinctive plumage. But there is one drawback of all DC motors, and that is with the commutator. The problem is that the brushes rubbing on the commutator all the time gradually wear themselves away and wear the commutator. And I haven't got one that's fully worn um, because I throw them away. Uh, this one's half worn. So you can see that there's quite a bit of thickness has gone from the commutator and that the brushes uh, are nearly down to the bottom of their travel. Probably last another year or so. As a rule of thumb, I reckon that if you run them continuously, they'll run for about five years. So it's not too bad. But um, for things like my the sign on the outside of my arcade on the pier, it's annoying because I'm probably on my fourth motor now. Uh, with that one, I'm actually planning to drill a hole through the building and have a, an AC motor indoors. Um, but that is the one thing that they're not good at, is for running continuously DC motors. Uh, so I thought for the rest of this video, I'd look at some of the alternatives to DC motors and look at their relative strengths and weaknesses. Well, one alternative is an AC motor, alternating current. Um, so then you, the electricity is going in a sine wave, backwards and forwards, reversing its polarity uh, 50 times a second or 60 times a second in America. The easiest and simplest, in a way, are three-phase motors. So in a three-phase supply, you have three of these sine waves, just a little bit different in their timing. Well, if you have uh, three coils around a motor, uh, one for each phase, this creates a naturally rotating uh, magnetic field. Well, that's the basis of almost all three-phase motors. Um, and you can do the same sort of thing with single phase. These motors just have two coils, um, but you can delay the phase to one of them quite simply with a capacitor. Uh, it will take a little while to charge up and then a little while to discharge. And if you get the right value, this can have the effect of delaying uh, the, the electricity going to one of the coils. So this is just a little um, AC induction motor that I've got, and that's its capacitor. Uh, and uh, one advantage of this is it's very simple to change the direction. You just have to swap the capacitor over to um, a different coil and go back the other way. This is the most common motor, sort of motor called AC motor, called an induction motor. And you very often see uh, on the side of these motors, the capacitor, it's often a sort of cylindrical thing. Or on this one, a vacuum pump I've got, uh, it's a rather bigger cylindrical lump all, all built in. So my favorite uh, AC motor, I think uh, there's a range of Panasonic motors um, they're expensive, but uh, they last a long, long time and they're very beautifully made. So uh, this Panasonic motor is actually powering the hands on my garden clock. It makes them move on once a minute. It used to be wiper motors, but I kept having trouble, so uh, this just lasts forever. 
These induction motors are almost fixed speed because they're sort of tied to the frequency of the mains. But these days uh, you can connect them via an inverter drive. So this is the motor on my milling machine. It's a three phase motor, um, but I only have single phase supply. So uh, the, the electricity comes into this gadget, the inverter drive, this gray box, uh, and that completely chops up the waveform and produces the three phases for the motor. But what's really nice is that uh, it can create different frequencies so it can control the speed. So all I have to do is to um, fiddle the, the, the dial at the bottom here to get whatever speed I want. In the past I used to have to change belts and fiddle with the gearbox and this is just so much easier. Although induction motors are much the most common, uh, there are exceptions. Uh, vacuum cleaners use a different sort of motor. These motors, also used for power tools, um, have a lot of power and will run over a large speed range. Actually much more like a DC motor. You can see uh, the commutator in there uh, and the brushes but they're noisy brutes uh, <laughs> and they don't have the long life of uh, other AC motors so I've never ever actually used one in one of my machines. I used to use a lot of these small um, they're called synchronous motors AC mains AC motors uh, and they don't have a lot of power they're not particularly well made. <laughs> it's got plastic gears inside the gearbox. But they, they used to be quite handy. I think what's happened, I hardly use them at all these days, is that DC motors became more widely available and cheaper, as did the power supplies as well. And so uh, it's just not having to bother with mains voltages is one less thing to worry about. But they do have their place, like... Uh, um, this is quite a nice one, a slightly bigger one. Uh, I use one of these for the sign in Novelty Automation and it's worked out very well. Another alternative to DC motors are stepper motors. Uh, these move in discrete steps, as their name suggests. There are two separate windings inside. Uh, the blue and red wires go to one, and the green and black go to the others. And uh, I've connected each set to a reversing switch here. So um, if I connect one, it'll uh, move the motor by one step. If I then connect the other one, should go a bit further. Then I reverse the parallelity of the first one, and reverse the parallelity of the second one. You can gradually make it rotate. And of course, if you do the switches in a different order, try and get this right, I can make it, should be able to make it go backwards. Of course, uh, motors aren't usually, these motors aren't usually controlled in this clumsy sort of way. Uh, they, they come with uh, uh, clever driver boards that I'll talk about in a minute. Ah, so inside uh, the motor, uh, you can see, so the stator has all these little ridges in it, and so does the rotor. And the motor's really only happy when the ridges line up, so they're the individual steps. Uh, and although there are eight coils uh, round here, uh, they're connected alternatively, so uh, four of them are connected to the black and green wires and the other four are connected to the red and blue. There are various different sorts of uh, stepper motors. This particular one is called a hybrid stepper motor, or sometimes a NEMA, uh, which is the style of the case. Uh, they come in different sizes. Um, and uh, they're much better than stepper motors used to be. Uh, in the past, I had a 
a funny old selection of different types uh, and the drivers were um, very peculiar and expensive and uh, weird so it, it makes life a lot simpler to sort of standardize on, on these hybrid ones. So uh, stepper motors are nearly always connected via uh, a driver um, so the the wires to the motor come out here uh, and this is the power in and then at the other end um, you've got the pulse input the direction and uh, enable just as I was doing with my switches uh, I can actually just send it individual pulses but again a very jerky sort of uh, motion and these are actually quite sophisticated they don't just switch the coils on and off they can actually send uh, sort of uh, sine waves which is called micro stepping uh, and using this you can get uh, different numbers of pulses to make a complete revolution so to create these pulses um, uh, well, one common way is to connect them to an Arduino um, So uh, here I've got my Arduino is just tr uh, a ramping uh, program uh, to start uh, the motor spinning gradually. But actually I have very common just use little circuits like this you just buy them on eBay um, and they generate pulses that and the speed is just controlled by a potentiometer on the side uh, so if I connect this up so if I now uh, plug this in I've got pretty good control over the speed. And what I quite often do is to actually, instead of using the potentiometer, I find the speed I want, measure the resistance and use fixed resistors. Uh, and then these can be switched by the logic controller uh, to make the motor go at different speeds at different stages of the, whatever it's doing. I have to admit though that I'm not a huge fan of uh, stepper motors. Um, they have various drawbacks. For a start, they're inherently noisy. Just because it's moving in these jerks, if you like. Um, then, uh, as you adjust the speed, This one isn't so bad, but some of them just have these uh, resonant points where they're really unhappy and don't work so well. Uh, that's probably less so with these hybrid uh, stepper motors, the recent ones. Um, but really the main problem is their lack of torque. Uh, compared to a, a DC motor of this side, this is pretty pathetic really. And then it, if, you, if it does seize up it just grinds to a complete halt uh, until you until you slow it right down and then it can get going again well I have this problem on the fulfillment center uh, there's a stepper motor that drives the chain around and most of the time it works perfectly but the speed is proportional to how fast you're walking so um, if you suddenly slam it into reverse, uh, the motor can get in a complete muddle and seize up just like that. Mm -hmm. I've tried all sorts of things, but uh, it still remains quite a problem. Of course, stepper motors are used for really, really precise things, like uh, on my plasma cutter. Um, but in situations like this, where it's really vital that they don't miss a step or just freeze up, uh, they have software that uh, controls the maximum acceleration. Um, well, 
This sounds very sensible, but in this case it did have some quite bizarre effects. Um, you're supposed to run it quite fast, the machine, for thin material. Um, but what's happening, it was just uh, randomly rounding off corners. On these buildings, they were supposed to have square windows and pointy roofs. Um, so anyway, I now disobey the instructions and run it a lot slower. <laughs> Well, stepper motors have their place, um, but personally, I think the future is brushless DC motors. Much more keen on them. Um, they've been around for a while, but they used to be really pricey things. So the idea is that instead of brushes to control the power to the coils, um, it's all completely electronically controlled. And this means uh, Instead of putting the coil on the armature, you can have them on the stator around the outside. Uh, and the rotor is just a permanent magnet. So, so there's really, there's nothing then to limit the life of these motors other than the electronics. Well, the, as I say, they used to be expensive, but uh, and they're now becoming widely used on a lot of consumer products. So washing machines have them, uh, drones, um, electric drills, uh, and of course electric bikes and, and scooters. Um, so the, the motors themselves are much easier to get hold of. Uh, this one is actually from uh, an electric drill, which I bought on eBay for 30 quid. It wasn't an expensive one. The, the motor goes in into the gearbox and stuff there. I was hoping I could use this as a, a standalone motor, um, but it's not easy to think of a way of uh, supporting it without using the motor's casing. It's all very much designed around that as a, as a way of holding the whole thing together. So in the end, I decided to just use the motor with the gearbox. It's a wonderful, powerful, epicyclic two-speed two gearbox uh, and then you've got uh, a clutch on the end. Uh, it's just quite fiddly getting it all back together again. I added this steel cradle to support it. That <laughs> made it even bigger. They may not be perfect solution for everything but they are certainly bargains you get the brushless motor uh, and the controller uh, a bit of electronics in the handle of the drill um, and you get the epicyclic gearbox uh, yeah so you've got a huge speed range there uh, you even get a torque limiter and then it, having the chuck makes it easy to fix things too and they're very easy to use I've extended these wires a bit but um, other than that it's just as it came um, so if I connect it to an 18 volt power supply um, it'll work just as a it's even got the reverse switch on too. <laughs> and the little light that <laughs> lights up what you're doing with the battery drill if you use one of these drills you'll know just how much power they have it's a really serious uh, motor and kit really I'm going to end by talking just a bit about servo motors. The big difference with these is that uh, in the back uh, they have what's called an encoder. This disc has very very fine lines ingrained in it. So as the motor rotates um, this sensor in here counts the uh, lines that it passes. So once it's connected to all the electronics, um, this motor knows exactly where it is. A lot of servo motors are brushless DC too, so they share the high starting torque and low noise of uh, other DC motors. Um, 
I've only ever used one once uh, on one of my machines. I don't usually need this sort of precision. Uh, they're the sort of thing you find on robot arms and, and that sort of industrial application. Uh, generally, servo motors have uh, external control circuitry um, to control the current to the motors. Um, but this one is actually called an integrated servo motor. Um, it's a smart motor. Uh, and th these have been actually been around since the 1990s. Uh, but at the time when they were first introduced, uh, the company uh, Animatics um, was trying to persuade people that they were easy to use. So they produced some very nice software, <laughs> which they called the Smart Motor Playground. So, um, and this is really why I sort of got into them because I could sort of, I could see they were fun. So uh, if I just send it back to zero, okay. So on my scale, it's reading 37.1 um, centimeters. So now if I uh, just whiz around a bit more, Now if I go back and ask it to go back to go back to zero again. 37.1. It's so precise, it's lovely. <laughs> this sort of precision is amazing to me. I know most so many people take it completely for granted, uh, but I'm not used to it. I used my smart motor on a tide gauge I made for the pier. At first this had a mechanical linkage from the chart recorder pen to a buoy that floated on the surface of the water. But the parts wore astonishingly fast. These photos were taken just uh, two weeks after I installed it. The power of the sea is just phenomenal. So I replaced the buoy with an analogue pressure sensor that was wired up to the smart motor that moved the pen. This worked for a few months but by then the pressure sensor was reduced to shreds. So at this point I just admitted defeat. After the disaster with the tide gauge I rather forgot about these smart motors but uh, getting them out for this video I uh, was enjoying playing with them again. Um, so I was wondering what I could do with them and I'm just trying to make a, a machine that will break an egg. So uh, I'll raise the hammer Oh, <laughs> well, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> uh, what the fuck's going wrong there? I don't know. Um, try one more egg. Tough these eggs. Uh, one more try. Ha! Ah, that felt like it. Yep. <laughs> A lightly cracked egg. The closest equivalent I can find today are Technic's clear path servos. They're more expensive than stepper motors, obviously, but uh, a lot cheaper than smart. At the end of this video, I hope you found something useful in it. Uh, I think despite all these fancy motors, I still really prefer my simple DC ones for my arcade machines. Um, they're just available in such a vast range of shapes and sizes. Uh, they're so cheap and easy to get hold of uh, and and they're high starting torque and uh, low noise. Uh, it's, they remain in some way the perfect motor.